Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art and music, specifically classical music, focusing on Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune. Today, I'm again joined by one of our executive contributors, the man I love, my heterosexual life mate, the only classical movement you will ever need, and that is Mr. T. Buck. Welcome, T. Buck. Thank you. Thank you. Here to talk about a poem that got turned into one of the great works of classical music. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've, so we've talked about at length musical careers, legacies, but today it's going to be Claire de Lune. And... I'm going to let me go into why. So for some reason, in the last, I would say, 10 years or so, this piece has literally been everywhere, Buck, like haunting me. OK, I mean, like from movies to video games. So like, give me some examples of where you've heard this at. Like, well, I don't want to. Ooh, I don't. Give me a minute. I, I know we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about that in the discussion section. And I actually have a doozy for you that you're going to go. Ooh. You know, one of our aha moments. But like literally, I mean, everywhere I went, I, I mean, I would see it in video games. I mean, when I would walk through the goddamn mall or in a restaurant, I would hear this piece. I mean, if there was literally an opportunity for sound to be present somewhere, you're bound to hear Claire de Lune sometime in your life. So we need to talk about it. So uh, we need to understand why it's important and, and so influential. But before we can do that, of course, we need a little background. So Claire de Lune is a piano suite. What does that mean? Uh, piano suite is just solo piano piece. It was written by French composer Claude Debussy, one of the first impressionist composers. Now, CDL is probably how I'm going to abbre abbreviate this bad boy. I'm not going to say Claire de Lune over and over again. So CDL, it's, uh, it's, it's French for moonlight or light of the moon. Yes. It's already Beautiful. getting sexy in here. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just went from six to midnight. Uh, in our pre-show talk, uh, Buck was like, "Is this Moonlight Sonata?" And I was like, "Now, now, let's let's not." I know. I get. Let's him. not cross pollinate it's, here. It, it both was, that's, that's Beethoven. And lighten him. Now, to really understand this piece, all you beautiful lovers out there, and especially Buck, you have to understand that this is actually a collection of pieces. It's not just one piece that I wrote for the, for the piano. It's a it's uh, four pieces that collectively was called Sweet Bergamasque. Now, just like B Buck was joking about, um, it really is taken from a poem. That's where Claude Debussy got his inspiration from. And the poem is literally called Claire de Lune. I'm going to read it here in a minute, but I'm going to talk a little bit more of the history. So it was originally composed in 1890, but it was reworked like almost excessively. Like he, he considered that it wasn't part of his mature sound and he revised it and revised it and revised it and i think the version that we hear more or less is the one that he put out in 1905 so that was interesting i i did not know that it, it actually changed because it's you, you, like you said you, you hear it everywhere and oh if, my god yeah you, like it's it's one of the most recognized mu musical pieces ever but i didn't know that it, it went through some uh revisions it went through a lot of revisions actually and he finally felt comfortable with you know uh, giving it out to the public and and letting it be licensed. Obviously, I don't think he would have ever known it would have been licensed like this, where we see it, like I said, literally fucking everywhere. But it is, and for good reason. So uh, it even went through some name changes. Originally, it was called Promenade Promenade Sentimentale, which means a sentimental walk. And uh, of course, he went back to Claire de Lune, and I'm glad he did. Claire, there's something about just the yeah. name Claire de Lune that is that is that conjures right conjures this feeling inside of you especially after you hear the piece right yeah well you know just the the word moon and romantic languages is so pretty anyway whether it's uh lune or luna you know sure it's i don't know it sounds pretty to us anglophones here <laughs> I <always laughs> absolutely think that. that's a good way to put it so uh like we said it was taken from a poem and this poem was by paul verlaine in 1869 so if you've done your math out there kiddos that's 21 years so uh after 21 years that the poem was released Cla uh, claude debussy was inspired by the piece and he wrote all these piano suites uh for it it's it's literally so i think to really understand it uh, I'm going to actually read the poem.
poem. It's short enough. And I'm going to give all you listeners out there the poem itself, because I actually didn't know this either. I didn't know it came from a poem. So, you know, we do we do our homework on the show. We do our research. And I was like, oh, OK, well, there it is. That's why. That's why. So this is Claire de Lune or Moonlight. Your soul is a select landscape where charming masqueraders and burgomaskers go, playing the lute and dancing and almost sad beneath their fantastic disguises, all seeing in a minor key of victorious love and the opportune life. They do not seem to believe in their happiness, and their song mingles with the moonlight. With the still moonlight, sad and beautiful, that sets the birds dreaming in the trees, and the fountains sobbing in ecstasy the tall, slender fountains among marble statues. End scene. Thank you. So what's fascinating about the poem is that if you actually read the words, it's up to interpretation. It's it's quite, uh, not confusing, but it is not finite either. It doesn't have a singular message or anything like that. And op- scholars often call the poem... Uh, not only famous for you know its unique style and its uh, its thematic structures and things like that, but the fact that it it it's it was designed that way. It was designed to evoke more of a mood, tone, emotion than give a message. And so, how fitting, right? How fitting yeah. that this piece that was designed to be uh, a mood setter, an emotional uh, entity, was eventually inspired a work of music which is exactly that right when you hear music it it's supposed to invoke a mood a tone and back then you had to put a lot more thought into some of these things as well like yeah well i guess today it's the same thing like a lot of music that is made that is supposed to invoke and it goes across all spectrums of music too that's supposed to invoke like certain feelings i mean anywhere from sadness happiness to uh you know baby make music <laughs> that's right so i think that's a good what a perfect segue into talking <laughs> about sweet bergamask itself uh so yeah. again to really understand claire de lune we need to understand the the suite of of pieces uh, again it's a collection can, of can four you tell pieces. us what bergamask means uh yes i can actually so uh when i first was doing my homework i thought a bergamask was a thing like an actual mask uh bergamask is a dance and so Burgomaskers in the poem is talking about dancers. So where charming masqueraders and Burgomaskers goes, he's talking about dancers, not a, and it, an and actual And it originated thing. from Bergamo, Italy, right? <laughs> I don't. I If you did your homework, I didn't go that far into I it. Did. I did. Oh, good. Okay, tell us then. I don't know. It's from Bergamo, Italy. <laughs> That's what I found out. You know, we know it's from Italy. We know that the birth Yeah, is no, Italy. I had to look up Bergamask too because I was like, what? What is, what is this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's it's definitely um, the n- region of nor- northern Italy where this comes from. And there's a certain dialect up there that's also called Bergamask. So, oh, okay. I, um, I, I, yeah. I know that. Thank you, Bob. Italy's an interesting country with all the different like regions oh, and my stuff God. and dialects and I've had the, historical uh, I've, context as well. I've had the pleasure of, being, of, of, of uh, studying abroad once. Not studying, but uh, vacation in Italy. Really? I went to I went to Rome. I went to one other city. I can't remember. Yeah, I was in high school. Oh, you're in high school. I you know what? I, I so I had a trip planned um my junior year of high school. Um we were going to go to Spain, uh mm-hmm. France and Italy. Mm. And a little thing happened on September 11th and they canceled oh, God. Our, um yeah. Oh god. It yeah. So I never got to do that. I'm gonna say I I've never I've actually never been to Italy. That you never been to Italy. Of all gotcha. the countries I've been to I've I've never been. Uh, you uh you need to do it definitely as as two hosts of a show about art. I mean the whole city just oozes beautiful art and decadence and just it's 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 gorgeous. It's a gorgeous. I've never. <laughs> it's almost like saying I've never been to a museum. <laughs> that's it he's fired i'm fired <laughs> heard it here first now buck's fired he's no longer allowed on the show i spent two days in the hermitage please <laughs> yeah he knows that's actually shit. really cool that's yeah. actually really cool if you ever get to check that out i will put it on the list on the bucket list so let's talk about uh so let's talk about sweet bergamask so obviously that's where he gets the bergamask from if you didn't get that from our long story and tangent uh the bergamask is within the poem Claire de Lune. So the four pieces are this. It's uh, Prelude, Menuet, Claire de Lune, piece three, the the, the centerpiece, uh, the main one we're, of course, we're talking about today, and Pasa, Pasapede, Pasapede, I don't know 
I don't know how to pronounce it with a French dialect. So just uh, bear with me, okay? And those are the four pieces. And this is where I really want to discuss, the discussion section comes in because, uh, Buck, did you actually listen to all four of them or did you just listen to Claire de Lune over and over again to kind of get it? Uh, just Claire, Claire de Lune. Yeah, okay. I, so I should have probably. I listened that. to all of them. I listened to all of them. And let me tell you this. This is why I was trying to, you know, piece together the thesis. Why is this so important? important so influential and i feel like uh back in now remember this was crossing a century you know and it and it was way ahead of its time because the four pieces kind of run together like a story it's almost like let's call it the first concept album you know mm-hmm. um yeah so the it really so prelude is like the introduction it's like, literally like a prologue Menuet is like when the story goes into a conflict, a struggle, and then it even crescendos, even the piece itself, into a, a climax. So then what's Claire de Lune? It's that resolution, right? And you hear it in the piece. You hear just, it's so, now, don't get me wrong, a lot of, you know, it's still subjective. I think a lot of people would call it, parts of it, melancholy or sad. But there's a hopefulness, I think, to Claire de Lune. Like, it just makes me smile every time I hear it. And then, of course, uh, Pasapede or Pasapede, Pied. That's, that's going to be the hardest one to pronounce. Uh, I, I know I'm butchering this, but uh, the last piece, I'll, I'll just say it that way, is is kind of like the epilogue. It's kind of like mm. closing the piece, you know, down or, or the collection of pieces down. And and so when I listen to them and I urge you, know, you, Buck, and all the listeners out there to listen to all of them together to really get the context, it it's so ahead of its time. And I think just just listening to Claire de Lune, you can hear, I don't know, man, this is where we need to really discuss it. I hear like a little jazz, you know, I hear the the foundations of jazz and modern song structure and even like and then tr- and then traditional modern piano soloing song structure versus other forms of classical, you know, where when I think of classical, yeah, like so Moonlight Sonata is a piano piece or Beethoven's other pieces or even a Fertilis. I feel like there still has that quintessential classical yeah. in orchestral sound where this is so, yeah, this is so fluid and moving and, and everything like that. So you're saying it's a little bit more, it's it's a little bit more free form, which is yeah kind of where you're saying there's a melody there you know there's the, a melody, the, very, but yeah. the very the very first series of notes is the main motif of claire de lune you know they go right into the chorus essentially we'll call it a chorus right away yes i'm thinking about it okay well while buck's thinking about it i don't want to give any dead air let's let's uh we'll come back to claire de lune and uh, buck's gonna give us the the speech of a lifetime after he thinks about this i oh see it on gosh. his goddamn face Yep, now you got to have to prepare. I'm going to make them now, squirm. Now I have you to guys, like, you guys start know making, I like writing making notes. them squirm. Yeah. So uh, Prelude is, like I said, the intro, the prologue, if you will. And it, it, it sounds that way in the composition. It's smooth. It flows. It's fluid. It just it just invites you in, right? And then, like I said, uh, Menuet is, is oh, gosh, such a dance. It's conflictual. There's a struggle. And then it, and, it, and it flows into this climactic essence. And then Claire de Lune is that boom. Like, we hit the climax. We're going down that mountain in the, in the story. And we are now at the resolution. And I feel great. Do you got something for me yet, Buck? Did that, did, that, did that conjure something in you yet? No. Well, I have, like, some thoughts on this. Okay, go. Okay. This song, <laughs> you're not going to like this. This song is on a lot of, because I was thinking about, like, I, I'm stuck on your jazz thing right now. That's, that's oh, where I'm at. okay. Because I'm a certain, the, 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 the gears are they're the turning. Gears are the gears are going. Little, that's, that's why the we The little mouse inside shit. of the head, it's, yeah. it's starting to spin on the wheel. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad you know? to hear that. But like I keep you know, debug sharp. That's that's this is why we're doing the show. Yeah, he's, you he's caught me off guard with this because Early now I'm like, dementia, now I got to keep him sharp with the show. On set, I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> um, no, you, you just it threw me off because now I'm like, that's all I'm thinking about now. Well, okay, so it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Like I'm just thinking like it's an interesting thought that I didn't have before, and like I almost want to dive a little bit more deeper into it. Well, but, and that's why we discuss. Uh, yeah. Let me let me premise that with. There's a reason I think it crossed. Remember, he he revised this many, many times, right? Have you listened to the original version? Yeah, I listened to the original, and I listened to the full orchestral arranged version. Because I don't think I've ever heard a full orchestral. I've always heard a piano. Just a solo piano. The solo piano. Well, uh, while we're on the topic, I would say if, if anybody out 
there has not heard this piece uh, that's listening right now, I would start actually with the full arrangement, the full yeah. orchestra, because there's something about it that is just so powerful and moving. And then I would hear just the piano, the solo piano version, because I think you'll get it right away, even if you're not musical. So all, all, yeah. all of my non-musical listeners out there, even if you're not musical, that's OK. That's OK. Listen to it and you will get it. Just embrace how you feel about the music. You don't have to you don't have to understand what's happening. Right. It doesn't matter. OK, it's it's supposed to hit you at the core. It's to hit you the way it's supposed to hit you. <laughs> should I change? Should I change my vocal back to how I did the poem? Yeah, I think you your should. Your soul is a select landscape. Your soul. <laughs> So like, I know it's it, getting real. The, it's getting the sexy The song in here. should hit you. It's getting really romantic. Where it in should here. hit you. So, anyways, going back. So, you know, it was originally composed in 1890, but it was revised again through 1905 until 1905. So, again, doing your homework, doing your math out there, kiddos. That's 15 years. That's a lot of time to rework one piece, and it crossed a, an entire century. So we went from uh, went from 19th century to 20th century, and that's why I think it. Um, he had a lot of time to push it. You know, be to allow it to be ahead of its time, to push it into the 20th century. So this was basically fame. He's smiling. Fame. This was basically fame of the, uh, you know, the the last uh, of the like early David 20th. Bowie's fame. Yeah, he had like three different versions of it, or like Layla. There was oh, like Layla. Oh, oh man. Here, now you got now you got now the now Derek t- and the Dominoes, and yeah, then you have the uh, soul. MTV I love you some Layla. Unplugged. So yeah, yeah there was different versions. I mean. Uh, we talk about Radiohead a lot. I know I know Buck can connect anything to Radiohead and think about how many versions of one piece you've heard from them. Oh yeah. Like uh True Love Awaits. True Love Waits, yeah. That's I've heard like eight different versions of that. Let's not go too deep down that tangent hole, but yes, but I guess the point is is I just I the whole point is that it was ahead of its time and that it was nothing like I think a lot of people heard. And I think that's probably why, you know, if if we're going to start talking more of connecting it to a thesis of its importance and influence is why it's resonates so much with people. Now, you don't hear fucking <laughs> most classical pieces that are that recognizable, mind you in like restaurants or department stores or you know there's there's something about it especially since they used a melody motif and yeah we did we've seen that in classical music before of course you know uh for is a easy example of that but we've never i don't think we've done it to where it was so simple and so poetic and so moving that it, it it's easy to connect to things and i think that's why it's probably everywhere now yeah i think you you it, it, especially when you have songs like this and i was thinking about this and you know to me the the best part of this is actually the you know that ending kind of minute or two of it it's just this very pretty like kind of oh yeah almost like that burdam you know that yeah <laughs> i was trying to explain how yeah one of the playlists you always hear this on is like a, a classical sleep playlist um <laughs> it is and, soothing, and i yes. it's very soothing and i think that's why you play that in a lot of settings or in a lot of like you said department stores or something like that yeah it's supposed to kind of ease yeah your, you know you don't want some anxiety you don't want to go shopping yeah. with metal music right it's not inviting so well i don't know stuff. about you <laughs> novo all the stores you go to yeah all the stores i go to i just want to hear death metal okay <laughs> Because that's really what gets Classic me into the Classic T-Buck. Death it's, Metal it's Department kind of, Stores. It's kind of like, you know, you know, when I'm at the dentist, you know, that's <laughs> yep. all I want to hear is thrash yep. metal. You want to be you really know? comfortable Screw at the Screw the Kenny G. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need that shit in here. We, we don't need. We don't. We don't need, we don't need, need the soprano doom saxophone. metal. We need. We need the war cry growl. Was it the soprano saxophone or is it the alto sax he plays? Who? Uh, Kenneth G. Oh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's got that little. I can know. I can see it in my head right now as we're talking about it. Yeah, I can see it in my head, but I don't know the exact type. I, I'll find nothing. out. Yeah, I, please I'll, do. No, I'll find out. I know, I know everyone because is on the I edge know of their seats. Like, yeah, on everyone's like, like, "Geez, I can't go to sleep tonight if I don't have this answer." Half of our audience is going, "Who's Kenny G?" And then the other <laughs> half of the audience is going, "What." What is that saxophone who, that he plays? Who the fuck okay. cares? Well, T Book's looking that up. Um, I, I just to close on uh, talking about the four sweet collection of pieces. So after Claire de Lune, so yeah, Claire de Lune is very light and airy, soothing and calming, and it yeah, it creates this essence of 
of welcoming an, an aesthetic, you know, soprano very, saxophone thing. It is soprano. Okay. Okay. Uh, worry not, everybody listening. It's soprano sax. You I sleep know. easy. Thank tonight. you. You sleep easy. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then the last piece, uh, Pasipede, uh, is fast and light, right? And it just kind of closes everything down. So let's, let's talk about, I think this is, you know, we're already, we're already kind of touching about it. I do want to talk about compositional a little more versus tone versus mood versus, of course, effect on the listener. And we touched on this and, uh, but I think there's a lot more to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do my hum thing. I do this, I think in every episode now, but you know, the main motif is, Da-da. You know, it just I just humming it right now, just mm-hmm. humming the notes. I'm just like, ah, oh, I, I'm, a, I feel, I feel, I, I, everything's okay in the universe, even when, yeah, uh, it's it's a shitty time because I have Claire de Lune's little melody in my head. It's playing. It's it's letting you know everything's going to be okay for the next. Three to four minutes. Three to four minutes, yes. Again, listen to the four orchestral version, and I guarantee if you were in a bad mood or a semi bad mood or even a five out of ten, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna feel good. I promise. So let's talk about its influence. Like I said, it's everywhere. First one that I thought was fascinating on a history level is that it was supposed to be part of Fantasia. Does everyone I, remember Fantasia, the uh, the animated musical or like classical music piece made by Disney that wasn't really for kids? That's how I, I remember. Every time I watch it, even as a kid, I'm like, "This isn't for kids." Well, okay. When I th- when I was a kid, I thought it was the most boring. Oh yeah, it was ever. And case as in an point, adult, yeah, as an adult, I think it's fantastic. Oh yeah, I love oh yeah. It. Like I wish they would do more stuff like this. And listen to <laughs> watch Fantasia, and you <laughs> minds will yeah. be blown. But no, it is. It is. It's gorgeous. And like gorgeous. the animation is beautiful for 1940. I mean, you know, Disney definitely pioneered like their animation style and stuff. And this was kind of a tech demo too. I didn't know that. Well, I just I remember, think, like, as a kid, remember, like, the the devil, the whole devil segment. Oh, you know, the, I don't remember the piece, but you know what I'm talking about. No, it, it's it was the just night like on Baldy Mountain or something like that. Yeah, it could be the night on night on Bald Mountain. Sorry, night on Bald Mountain. Is that the, yeah? Are you sure that's e, the piece? E, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty. Well, sure. everybody knows what we're talking about. The the whole, literal yeah. Like, there's, there's like an this entire big, scene. Yeah, this like demon like, creature demon looks like the thing. devil essentially. But then Ave Maria's right after the whole segment. But yeah. But I'm yeah, I, sure I, I think case in point, you made a good point. It's like as a kid, it was it was boring, right? And that's why yeah. I remember I was one of those kids that was very objective. I remember there was a lot of times in my life where I was like, "This is not for kids." You know, another example that popped in my head when I was doing the outline for this fucking Ren and Stimpy. Do you remember Ren and Stimpy on Nickelodeon? Yes, it's probably one of the greatest adult cartoons that exactly. was and targeted again, towards children. It's again, very wrong. case in point, I remember watching Ren and Stimpy as a kid with my dad and and looking at my dad being like, I love this, but this is I, this is not for kids. How, why, how am I watching this? Why am I allowed to watch this right now? My dad loved watching it with me. He would be cracking up like in I it was a bonding thing, I think, with, yeah. with sons and their dads, or dads and their daughters, maybe. Well, even looking it was a back thing. at, yeah, even looking back on that, some of the original Looney Tunes like video, I've watched them. I was like, I there was a lot of adult humor in it, you know, that you just don't pick up as a kid. And uh, yeah, another example now that we're talking about is I, I used to love uh, Rocco's Modern Life. I was about probably the time I stopped watching Rocko's cartoons, Modern Life. and I got kind of into anime. But I remember just thinking, this is this you're, is almost like Crazy Town. Come on. Novo, you're, you're a big Doug head. I do. Oh, I love Doug, but Doug you was like, Doug was you safe. Like dressing up like Qu- Quail Man, and I liked Patty Mayonnaise. You love. You had a huge crush on Patty. <laughs> I had a mayonnaise. huge crush on Patty Mayonnaise, and then there was right. Skeeter. <laughs> yep. So that what a, what a good dichotomy. So that was such a safe cartoon show versus it was a good. Uh, yeah, versus Ren and Stimpy, and then let's pull a background circle to Fantasia, <laughs> where it was not. It was. It was. It was definitely. It was so artistic, right? And so the whole point of us talking about fucking Fantasia is the is the fact that it it never actually made the cut. There's there's yeah. special editions of Fantasia where you can listen to the and I think with it's paired up with the animated scenes of Claire de Lune, but it was never in the original run. So they so they do have some animated yeah. scenes to it. 
interesting i'll yep. we'll have to check and like it out. very like you know if you buy like you know the blu-ray whatever version is now with behind a million, the scenes with all the special features yes i love special features though i mean i love claire de lune like was removed from fantasia and that's why walt disney had his head frozen so that he could originally come back <laughs> in the future no, god i wish it would, i wish it had a cooler history it, honestly it was just runtime they just they just couldn't it was just it a in. run it, yeah yeah it was just a runtime issue that's, it was no like cool thing yeah and i think another example of of uh how it's its influence has affected kind of modern culture is is uh something that we've bonded over for a long time and i had no idea that this was that claire de lune was in this until i did research for this but it's in janelle monet's song say you'll go go. yeah say you'll go i got you on the album yep it was like the arc android it was her first LP, something yeah. like that. Great album. Great album. And that's like our favorite song from that album, I would say, right? Yeah. And in the yeah. bridge, they work in Claire de Lune. I'm trying to is it toward in the bridge, you said? It's in the middle. Yeah. There's a whole orchestral um, you know, yeah, classical part. And I thought it was just a made up classical part for the song. I had no idea that it was actually a sample of Claire de Lune this whole time. I'll have to go back and listen to that. I mean, how much homework did you do? Like, did you find any any little Easter eggs of like so Janelle Monet's Say You'll Go is such a perfect example of how it has seeped into modern society culture. And then we didn't even kind of realize it. Um, mm-hmm. I have another one. I don't want to say it just yet, um, but it, it definitely fits into this uh, very clear message of how Claire de Lune is, is supposed to make you feel. But uh, did you find anyone uh, that really stuck out to you? I thought the Fantasia one was good. The Janelle Monet one was good. And then I have one more that I know we're going to go in a tangent corner on. But I wanted to give you the floor for a little bit. No, I, I was actually both of those like little snippets were very interesting because I'm actually I, I'm a huge fan of. I know this sounds weird. I love Fantasia. Like I, I watched I it. I did not know that. I when like I was you older, love I was it, like, like you watched no, it I just, to this day. I, why, why can't we have more of these? More of this. Like I thought. Uh, like yeah, that's a good point. Even we don't if have it's it not anymore. made for kids, like it, it's a good way to introduce kids. The cl- I think part of it, you know, helps introduce people to like classical music and or important music and things like that. And that's you know, as I've gotten older, I I've always thought like we have to preserve a lot of this and this type of music and really before it fades away you know yeah i don't think well, it, it necessarily think will but uh, like as long as we have the capabilities to record and to archive i don't think yeah. it'll ever go away unless like our entire species like you know if aliens you know want to wipe out the human race then of course yes it, we're, it's gonna like how i, yeah, I don't know haven't I, you watched ai <laughs> i have i have that was Spielberg, you know, Spielberg's AI, right? God, talk about a movie that was just, like depressing throughout. I honestly don't remember. I remember like getting emotional and like tearing up at at these rope, you know, these sad robots. But I, yeah. I literally don't remember any of the plot except for I think it's like Haley Joel Osment is in it, right? Haley Joel Osment. I see dead then, people. Six cents, little boy actor. Yeah, and then they had uh, Ted before Ted. Sorry, there was a there was a robotic bear. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm but Ted is Ted like the movie. Yeah, Ted is it's like a magical bear. Is like you know, Family Guy. Every character in Family Guy rolled into one, and of course, it's I, from I know. it's from what's his name, uh, Seth MacFarlane. There we go. Seth I MacFarlane. like Seth MacFarlane's work for the record, uh, but it's all kind of they all kind of are the same kind of humor, but it's it's fun. So let me okay, I'll dive into a kind of medium that we're starting to see Claire de Lune in more and more, and that is video games. We love video games here at NDP, and we absolutely think it's an art form. I know you're not a uh, horror fan, but there's a game, there's a horror game uh, called The Evil Within. You may have at least heard about it or saw previews for it, you know, when it was uh, being marketed. But, you know, in every, you probably at least know this, in every horror game, I think you've played at least one Resident Evil, right? Oh, yeah, like Resident Evil 2, yeah. Yeah, okay. So... And every what, Resident Evil, they what, created... What do you think of me? <laughs> what, am I a peasant? No. Uh, <laughs> no, so uh, so Resident Evil popularized uh, survival horror. And one thing that they did was the save room, right? The save room or safe room. 
not S-A-V-E. You literally do get to save your progress in these rooms, but it's safe. It's S-A-F-E, where bad guys can't get to you. And Shinji Mikami, who essentially is the godfather of Resident Evil, you may not know this, is the same guy that did The Evil Within. He did a completely different different horror franchise. And guess what song they used for their save rooms slash safe room? Let me guess. Yep, go ahead and guess. Starfuckers Incorporated. Yep, it was that one. Nine Inch Nails, okay. Starfuckers. Yep. No, it. Uh, it was Claire de Lune. <laughs> it was Claire de Lune. Uh, and yeah, as soon as you got into the room, I think that's that was the first time in the last 10 years where it got on my radar again. It was it, it started with this game. I remember going into the save room and hearing that duh, 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 and feeling that think, feeling that safety. Yeah. Do you think it was it was an artifact that they actually put in there just to kind of like maybe relieve some of the tension as well? Like Absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. It, I think it was it was. It was both knowing that you are literally safe in the save room or safe room, but also it created that immediate mood in you because that's what games do as I would argue until I am fucking blue in the face that games are art and they affect our moods and our and our emotions. And yes, a horror game, of course, is going to have a ton of tension and a lot of scares and thrills and, and jump scares and what have you. And of course, in, like any scary movie, you need that break. You need that that time to come down yeah another game that in in, you can also kind of twist some of that calming music especially if you modify the pitch or things like that like you can even make it sound a little eerie so that's where i was thinking maybe that you were going with that a little bit because i think of like another game that kind of uses uh some of the like this old-timey like music that kind of helps calm you a little bit but also kind of creates the atmosphere is something like fallout so yeah you'll have to speak more to fallout because i never got into fallout don't come after me twitter mob i i know fallout's a great game except for 76 uh, well but- and, and, and four you could you could even say was they they watered it down to kind of be a little bit more general for audiences but i think we can all agree that fallout new vegas is like the best but anyway i think of like <laughs> fallout 3 where you're basically in a you know, nuclear wasteland, you're walking around and you're, you're, you're listening to like, like old, like jazz popular music from the twenties and thirties, you know, world on fire, or, you know, I think there was some Billy holiday and stuff in there, Ella Fitzgerald that you just listen to. And it's like kind of these sweet, the sweet music that as you're walking around and trying not to get killed by raiders or um, beasts that jump out. And and it's like this. Yeah, like the music to me, like it really, (laughs) it was the one thing that kind of eased you a little bit because it it really, it's one of those games that really creates an atmosphere that you probably, it's not like, it's not a heartwarming game. I mean, you're walking around a nuclear wasteland and people are basically just trying to survive. So music like that, I, I think to your point, can kind of help change the the tone a little bit and kind of bring you into a little bit more of an ease. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh pulling it back to horror games is you need that. You need the roller coaster yeah. element of of the game not only in the mechanics uh or a movie or what have you. You know, as long as it's a visual medium, you know. I guess I mean, well, you could there's obviously horror stories and books and novels, but uh you can't connect music to a novel. Uh, unless it's like an audio book, uh, but or you're uh, playing it in the background while you're you reading. Yeah, you can, but you'd have to. Oh God, what a job to to have to <laughs> find how pieces would would be uh, how parallel what's going on in the story. So the the whole point is, yeah, they have uh, music supervisors and things like that that know that the the smart ones know where to pick pieces like Claire de Lune and put them into different kinds of media. And um, I don't have a ton of the, like there's like whole websites dedicated to this. You literally just have to put, I like would put in like Claire de Lune pop culture or Claire de Lune movie or TV show. And it's like in a million movies, a million TV shows, a million commercials. And uh, it's literally everywhere. And, um, and, and uh, I, again, yeah, bringing it around circle to the fact that uh, w- why is it everywhere? Yeah, let's talk about that for what, what makes a song or a movement kind of lasting like that? Like, I mean, like you said, you hear this everywhere. This is just as recognizable as for a lease or, you know, any, um, you know, one of the classic orchestral 
classical music pieces. What what do you think really goes into that? Like, how do you make something timeless like that? Well, it's uh, God. It's a lot of things. I think I think uh, we've talked about this at length. It's there's a lot of genius and brilliance and simplicity i think yeah. uh, musical motifs something that people can hum just like how popular music is today you know you can't you can't really uh get a banger <laughs> you can't get a banger if you don't have vocals right people have to connect to it people have yeah. to connect to it the easiest way to connect to music is uh especially if you're not musical is to sing to it you know learn the lyrics learn the chorus and the chorus is you know this is where we can talk about theory and things like that where very, very smart people, much smarter than me, probably as smart as Buck, know how to use the theory, you know, going from different scales or modes and letting things really pop. You know, a good example of this, I've talked about this before, is the police. Uh, they would they would write their main parts in minor minor scales or a, a minor key, and then they would always put their courses into a major. So it would really pop, it would really shine. And I think on a, on a, on a very theoretical level, I imagine people as brilliant as Claude Debussy, of course, are thinking about how to do that in the phrasing of his pieces. And so just hearing, again, that main melody, I urge you to, you know, like stop this recording, listen to it, and then come back to it. Uh, it, it. It conjures, right? It conjures this, especially when I heard the entire full orchestra version of this, it just conjured this this feeling of awe, mm-hmm. this, this moment of awe, and it was just mesmerizing and spectacular and every fucking adjective you can think of that is 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 why we <laughs> why we're alive and talking about this kind of thing yeah. It, yeah no i think i think in what i was trying to get to is I, I trying to lead you along the discussion here was i i think that's what a lot of music is and to people it's it's you know as we've talked about it hits an emotional chord with people and i think that that's why um a lot of music is is popular and, and especially some of these original pieces i mean going back and you think about it, how many songs are produced today you know that kind of fall off or you know throughout time but like at the in it's amazing at like this point why are some timeless versus yeah. some that aren't why why is cheeseburger in paradise so popular <laughs> and, I, I was wondering you know, where you'd fit in your your uh your jimmy buffett reference <laughs> The Buffett, yeah. right? Yeah, I literally forget every time we talk about it. It's Jimmy Buffett, I, he, right? He, he's the bane of my existence. <laughs> he's the bane of fucks. That's that's we have to work him in into every single episode. And it is true. Why music. is Cheeseburger and Parasite Paradise so beloved? Come on, and... Monday. What's your best song? You should have. Yeah, <laughs> come on, man. I just I I can't stand it, and it bothers me all the time. And but yeah, there's <laughs> maybe I need to go therapy for it. I I don't know. <laughs> just to, <laughs> just to pull it back. Let's do a Novo pullback. Is uh is yeah. I think to your point, uh, there's a reason things some things are timeless and connect to people. And 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 there's an element that. I mean, yeah, we can shit, man. We could talk about theory and emotion and mood. And, and yeah. there's just some things that I think this is the I think this is a good place to end on on this topic before we go into the outro and talk, talk about some gems is this is the thing about music. I think it's the closest thing to magic that we have, because there's something magical about music that no other medium can do. There's an element that we cannot explain. And I think that's like with a lot of music like this, and especially when it hits that tone, it's it's always yeah, it's always it's always going to be a part of you. It's always a part of let's say soul, um, because it hits that chord with you. And yeah, and no pun and that's intended, cool. it's that chord. Yeah, no pun intended. I mean, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I really did not <laughs> mean that. And and that's the that's the beauty of this art is in in art itself is that if it and that's why we we love talking about it. That's like that's why we have it around us at all times, whether yeah. it's. It's a painting on your wall or, you know, something you play in your car on the way to work. It's it, it hits that chord with you. And as humans, I think we we kind of need that. So with that, I think that's a good place to close. That is Claire de Lune, top to bottom. Thank you guys so much for listening. That's uh, we are. We were so happy to talk. I was so excited to talk about this and uh, there'll be more to come. But before we go, of course, we need a little more. Right. We need a little icing on the cake, a little cherry on top with what we call the gym of the week the gym of the week is essentially something we want to talk about in our show here but doesn't quite uh fit into the scheme of but uh we want to share it with you nonetheless i have literally no i'm i'm always impressed by bucks um gems he always has really thoughtful gems so i'm gonna let him go first because mine is not as thoughtful uh (laughs) so go ahead and give it to me (sighs) oh fine 
I will go first, like as always. I will carry the show. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, Thank God. No, no, I love going God, through this. Um, no, so like when I'm always thinking of, you know, we, we were talking about a classical music piece, and I always like to think of some things that are kind of lingering out there that I think need a little bit more attention or like especially with classical music. Uh, I'm thinking of the uh, composition by John Adams, not the second president of the United States or one of our founding <laughs> fathers. He is the composer. Uh, another another guy in the minimalist uh, kind of uh, Wait, Give game. me a little history lesson because uh, I like probably a lot of people listening and myself right now. I, I need a little back. Who's John Adams and what is the piece? Well, John Adams, he's a composer um he what era like i contemporary he, he probably oh, contemporary. got okay. his start um you know i would say it, it, he's kind of in the same school as philip glass ah, um, okay. got his now we're, uh kind of the minimalist the like yeah late 70s uh or mid mid to late 70s 80s kind of uh really minimalistic uh sound really started becoming popular kind of you know came into the light and fold um but he's basically made a lot of uh, uh operas or kind of musical pieces just like um uh, philip glass has like one mm-hmm. of them i'll probably do is uh Acknotten someday which okay. is one of my favorite um, pieces but philip glass he did a um he wrote a uh, a piece called a composition called Nixon in China. Okay. So um, historical context: Nixon yeah. visited China to kind of help with relations because we almost went to war with China. Um, gotcha. It was getting pretty bad. But he wrote a piece that I love, and it's called "The Chairman Dances," or in parentheses, uh, "Foxtrot for Orchestra." It's a thirteen-minute piece. Hmm. Um, definitely check it out if you played Civilization Four. Um, okay. It was a big uh, back to games again. Yeah, it was a big piece, especially if you played as the uh, American Empire. Say it one more time. I want to. I want to. I want to burn it into my memory. The chairman dances. In parentheses, the subtitle is Foxtrot for Orchestra. I see. God, uh, T Buck delivers again. Very thoughtful, Jim. I have. You you know it's thoughtful when I'd ne- I've never heard of it because between me and and Buck we are uh, walking encyclopedias sometimes like that's fascinating okay my my gym is actually uh, less of a gym and more of what you know when I was thinking about doing one of these shows about talking t- just talking about one piece for an entire you know episode that was influential and and groundbreaking and a lot of things this was and so mark my words we will eventually do a show on this piece as well. And uh, that is the Beatles is uh, the most covered song of all time. The Beatles is yesterday, yesterday. I think, is a very yesterday. Yesterday. Yep. All it's most covered songs. Yeah, ever. And I feel like uh, that would be a perfect song, a perfect piece for an entire episode one of these days. So, yeah, mark our words. And then and then John Adams. We'll we'll have to do his now, and uh, I, I think we need not to the do, president. We'll make that clear. Not, not the president. Pr- not not the round, <laughs> short round, angry politician. Not, not the president. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening again. If you like that, of course, you can follow us at at underscore Novo underscore day and day is D-E and at Novo Day Media. Of course, you can check out our stuff at NovoDayProductions.com. So until next time, be good to each other. And as always, good luck. Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions, created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company, facebook.com slash music 123 ACO on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.